All right, um, everyone, welcome to our talk tonight. We are very privileged to host Professor Daniel Wolf tonight, who has accepted kindly our invitation. Well, before I give the floor to him, I would like to introduce him a little bit and his work. Well, Professor Wolf is a 1980 graduate of Queen's University in Kingdon, Canada, Kingston, Canada, and he earned his doctorate at Oxford University in 1983. He's worked as a professor or academic administrator at Queen's and four other universities across Canada. Well, his research focused on two areas mainly, early modern British intellectual and cultural history, and the global history and theory of historical writing. He's the author of five books and co-editor of several others. His articles have appeared in prestigious journals such as Past and Present, the American Historical Review, History and Theory, Renaissance Quarterly, and the Journal of the History of Ideas. Professor Wolf holds several fellowships and memberships, and his work won multiple awards and prizes. The list is really long there, so I'm just not going to mention all of them here. Well, uh, he's a professor of history and principal emeritus at Queen's University since 2000. Well, today his talk is entitled, Written by the Victors, Further Reflections on History from Loss. The talk is related to his latest co-edited book uh, entitled History from Loss, a global introduction to histories written from defeat, colonization, exile, and imprisonment. Came out 2023. Just a few words on his latest book and then I will give the floor to him. Well, the book History from Loss is really a challenge to the prevalent notion that history is written by the winners. So the book explores how history makers have written histories from loss in different contexts, even when their effort posed a threat to their safety. The book opens windows to several such history makers' lives and ideas and offers important extracts from their works that uncover various meanings of loss. They range from physical ailments to social exclusion, exile to imprisonment, and dispossession to potential execution. The volume also deals with how information has been weaponized to cause harm, so the text helps to put current debates about biases, social media, and the politicization of history into global and historical perspectives. So uh, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Professor Daniel Wolf. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Tardo, and uh, thank you all very much for the kind invitation, particularly to A.F. Mark Curit for issuing it in the first place. Uh, delighted to be here, and I thank you all for staying up very late on a, on a weeknight to, to listen to this. Uh, just a bit of background, as, as you heard, um, I recently published, uh, and liter literally in the last few weeks, this book, History from Loss. It is available open access, by the way, for anyone who is interested uh, online. And my co-editor and I, Marnie Hughes Warrington at the University of South Australia, and I wrote a relatively short introduction. Um, I, I wasn't entirely happy with it, not because I think it's wrong or anything, but because I thought there was actually so much more to say, but we decided we wanted to give the maximum amount of room to our actual contributors uh, and not us. So I actually wrote a quite separate piece uh, this set of reflections, uh, which I hope at some point to publish somewhere. Um, and uh, there it will draw a little bit from the introduction to the actual book, but mainly it's it's new material. And um, 
I'm going to begin with a quote from a, an Albanian exile in Venice in 1504 named Marin Barletti, who wrote, when something unusual occurs in the history of mankind, something exceedingly bitter and heavy and for which to mourn, something we can assume has happened either to show the frailty of man or to awaken a kind of compassion toward one another, then usually certain people emerge who not only have observed the bitter event with awe and pity, but who also attempt to pen it into life. And I then continue with a different quote from a 19th century Irish nationalist called Thomas Davis, who asked the question, where are the annals of the conquered? Who shall bring garlands to the nameless grave? Well, among the many notions concerning history repeated in casual conversation, social media, and popular culture at large, one of the most commonplace is the remark that history is written by the victors at the cost of obscurity, villainization, or outright oblivion for the defeated. Now, the origins of that idea are quite obscure. It is often attributed to Winston Churchill, who, of course, had firsthand experience writing history as a victor. But if Churchill actually said it, which I think quite doubtful, then it's virtually certain that he was repeating something he himself had heard long before. Well, the question of the origins of the phrase, I don't think, need detain us further. What is important is the degree to which the written by the victors idea is accepted as true, or at least repeatedly quoted as if it were true. Current students of the Generation Z cohort, for instance, including my own undergraduates, appear to believe this very strongly, not least because it's a cliche that they account a great encounter a great deal in popular entertainment and, and culture. For example, there's a highly successful video game uh, called Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, uh, released in 2009, and a player opening the game will be greeted by a dark view of a satellite orbiting the Earth and an ominous voice intoning that history is written by the victors, history is filled with lies. As a corollary uh, to all of this, and despite the fact that arguments and disagreements about what happened in the past are the engine that drive the historical profession, history is sometimes seen as having little or no capacity to represent multiple sides, especially losing ones. As the narrator of a 1983 Canadian film called Sans Soleil, Without the Sun, uh, about contemporary Japan remarks, history, quote, throws its empty bottles out the window. Distrust of the facts of history and of the academic elites who both gatekeep the profession and certify or credit the results of research has become a rather pernicious hallmark of the so-called post-truth era. An unwillingness to accept the validity of evidence has moved in some circles beyond the measured skepticism and suspension of belief that should underlie all approaches to the past and into willful and often conspiratorial distrust of all versions of the past that do not conform with one's deepest convictions or feelings. The notion that history is invariably written by the winners conveys the sense that to the victor go the spoils of getting to assess and assign meaning or value to the past. Left and examined, it produces extreme cynicism with respect to knowledge of the past and is thus not merely wrong, but dangerous. Fortunately, like many popular notions about the past and about the representation of the past in written or other forms, for example, monuments or buildings, it is an oversimplification. 
The British historian Donald Bloxham is correct, in my view, in his recent book entitled History and Morality, to reject as flawed the assertion that history is always written by the victors, the powerful, the winners, and therefore, amongst others, the killers. It's not even universally true that it must be written by other than survivors of defeat, though wrestling with immediate or delayed trauma of defeat can, as we'll see, be an important stimulus to subsequent historical writing. Even the dead can record and testify to their fate, as demonstrated, for instance, by Emanuel Ringelblum's heroic project of preserving an account of life in the Warsaw Ghetto. The duty to bear witness has a lengthy history dating back via the Reformation to late antiquity, the very word martyr deriving from a Greek word for witness and signifying ultimate spiritual victory in a sphere of existence beyond the earthly. In the past several decades alone, some of the most innovative work in history and related disciplines has been driven precisely by a wish to give representation to the underrepresented and their stories. It is not going too far to say that history from below, microhistory, gender and sexuality history, indigenous and aboriginal history, to name a few, would simply not exist but for a shared impulse on the part of some influential 20th century historians, building on the work of a much smaller number of 19th and early 20th century scholars, to recover entire segments of the world's past populations hidden from history, to use Sheila Robotham's phrase, and to rescue the voiceless, the unheralded, the forgotten, the losers, as the great E.P. Thompson called them, from what Thompson himself termed the enormous condescension of posterity. This is not the place or time to review all the successes of non-mainstream history, which within the academy has in fact become the mainstream and spun off many substreams as a result. But with some exceptions, popular media, film, television, and bookshop shelves tell a different story, one much more conventionally tied to conflicts and victors, even if victory be obtained after a heavy dose or long period of defeat. In fact, all the better for dramatic purposes. It's thus easy to understand the persistence of the notion that the victors alone tell the tales. Historians, one author has observed, quote, are terribly bad at writing about failure. History has long been a highly persuasive and at times celebratory discourse, and its knowledge undercoated much of modern life. It can even become, as Martin L. Davies remarks, the ultimate form of mental coercion. So-called official histories, have generally aimed for a homogeneity of viewpoint expressed from the perspective of power and a sense, not always unjustified, of moral superiority in the overcoming of obstacles. Such was true of the standard histories produced in imperial China, wherein each ruling dynasty created the authoritative picture of its immediate predecessor's rule, including the latter's loss of the authority supporting mandate of heaven, though of course the very act of committing the defunct dynasty's record to an official history can just as reasonably be seen as an intent to ensure that the loser's story was told. State-sponsored history has been a highly successful genre, most often composed in a major key. And there are many examples of the suppression of the losing side's understanding of the past, or simply of successful regimes declining to record or glossing over their own losses. This was a feature of the ancient Assyrian annals that boast of victories and fail to mention defeats known to us from other sources. And it can be seen in modern authoritarian and totalitarian regimes, such as Stalinist Russia, as well as in fictional representations, 
such as George Orwell's novel 1984, with its memory hole for embarrassing documents that require erasure. One can imagine an official history written by a triumphant Nazi regime in a world in which the Axis powers had won, and counterfactual novels are full of fictional versions doing precisely that. We see the power of dominant views of the past in many places other than history books. Public monuments have had an outsized place in social memory and in public historical consciousness of both triumph and defeat. As lieu de memoire, places of memory, in Pierre Nora's well-known phrase, they are frequently sites of debate as to where the lines are drawn between victory and loss, and even between virtue and villainy. What is and is not deemed significant, or is even considered to be an event, is contestable and fraught with sensitivity. Monuments and other public exhibits also come into conflict with public and individual memories of the events they are supposed to commemorate, as, for instance, in the controversy in the mid-1990s over the Smithsonian Institution's Enola Gay exhibit to mark the 50th anniversary of the dropping of atomic bombs on two Japanese cities. Or it can even stir up dissent within the groups to whom they are devoted, a phenomenon that has increased as the use of the term genocide has broadened in recent decades beyond the Holocaust. Memorials to local and national icons have become the subject of intensive campaigns for removal or even for destruction and of countervailing campaigns to preserve monuments in place and recall successful military and political figures in a positive light, despite the discovery that the records of many are spotted with offenses ranging from slave trading to oppression of indigenous populations and even genocide, the ultimate effort to eradicate an entire people and its history. It's important to note, however, that not all such monuments are to victors or even to named individuals. Genocide monuments such as the iconic blocks and paths of Berlin's Holocaust Memorial testify to the victims of 20th century history in the millions, many of whom's names are lost. So too do cenotaphs and monuments to the unknown soldiers. And it is such memorials as these, as Dmitry Nikulin writes, that the very namelessness itself is the point. Intentionally preserved, the anonymous lost become, quote, a political gesture against oppression. Now, while debates within the historical profession may arouse little interest or excitement outside the halls of academe, what gets taught in schools is a different matter. Virtually no industrialized nation or sub-sovereign jurisdiction has escaped controversies over textbooks inspired either by suggested reforms in the direction of inclusivity or coming to terms with uh, uh, the past by government censorship or even government efforts to homogenize history into a winning account and to purge it of countervailing currents. And this is not a perquisite of Western countries trying to preserve a glorious tradition from critics who would prefer to read it warts and all. It's also a feature in emerging economies such as India's, where the recent Hindu nationalist governments have imposed an ethnically and religiously singular narrative on school history curricula. It's important to acknowledge, however, that such acts do not always reflect sinister or authoritarian thought control. Selection of topics, to be fair, can be a challenge in any context and in a school year with limited contact hours and texts of a certain length, leaving out a few pages on Captain Cook, Sir Francis Drake, or Thomas Jefferson, to use exclusively Anglo-American examples, in order to provide students with information on, say, pre-1788 Australian Aboriginal culture, the sins of empire, or the condition of President Thomas Jefferson's slaves, will nearly always invite disagreement. But decisions on inclusion 
are also judgments about what is important in the collective memory, and what has won and shaped the present is more often than not deemed more important for students to know than what's been left behind. Histories above mentioned empty bottles. So one can appreciate the dilemma of school boards and teachers, especially in the publicly funded sector, wrestling with such issues, and also the frustration of those not necessarily always arguing from the right side of the political spectrum, who see the dissolution of national shared stories as corrosive of consensus, community, and civic values. The critique would be reformers of American history curricula and their efforts to replace winners and heroes with minor figures and tales of oppression is a case in point and by no means unique. But unfortunately, the complexity of society is such that homogenized history creates as many problems as it solves. As the Australian historian Bain Atwood has observed, the problem with shared history is that the state insists that everyone should have the same kind of history. So, the notion that the victors have a monopoly on historical truth is thus not simply an ill-informed popular cliche disputed by academics and intellectuals who know better. On the contrary, it has frequently been endorsed by professional historians. Sometimes, quote, those who were defeated have made as great a contribution to the ultimate result as the victors, wrote E.H. Carr in his famous 1962 book, What is History?, making a point to which I'll return below. But by and large, Carr continued, the historian is concerned with those who, whether victorious or defeated, achieved something. In the six decades since Carr's book, the conviction that what we know about the past is disproportionately shaped by the winners of military conflicts, by the politically triumphant, by dominant social or ethnic groups, and by hegemonic cultures, has continued to find ample support among professional historians and cultural critics, though from a far more critical stance than E.H. Carr's. Anti-colonial writers since the time of Franz Fanon and C.L.R. James, endorsed by sympathetic European intellectuals such as Jean-Paul Sartre, have pointed to the ways in which knowledge and understanding of the past is inevitably distorted by its perception through filters established by colonial governments, anxious to create the impression that history has ended in the correct way, that way being seen as variously virtuous, civilizing, modernizing, liberalizing, and in the most teleologically wiggish of accounts, often inevitable. Some of this critical writing is concerned with absence and silence as not merely a fact of history, but as a factor in historiography, its failure to treat the uneventful and the normal on equal terms with the extraordinary. To be able to write that which Susan A. Crane recently describes as the history of nothing. Among many treatments of um, absence and silence, the late Haitian scholar Michel Roth Trio's Silencing the Past is especially noteworthy in showing how, quote, silences entered the process of historical production at four crucial moments. The moment of fact creation, the making of sources, the moment of fact assembly, the making of archives, the moment of fact retrieval, the making of narratives, and the moment of retrospective significance, the making of history in the final instance. Trio's formulation is important in identifying not merely the writing of history, but the creation and curation of its sources as contributing to the elision of much of the past. And recent works on the place and function of the archive remind us that what is missing from a collection can be just as significant in historical writing as what remains. Entire pasts can be not simply excluded, but occluded, blocked off either by accident or design. Various philosophers have criticized history's fixation with victory, success, and achievement. 
Friedrich Nietzsche, the most incisive and eventually influential observer of the historical culture of the late 19th century, periodically mused that there was too much history about and spoke of the virtues of forgetting as a way of shunting off its burden. In his early work, The Untimely Meditations, Nietzsche warned of the burden of monumental history, one of his three types, along with antiquarian and critical history, that should be practiced in unison rather than separately. Such history, focused on exemplary lessons and models, celebrated only the great achievements and heroics of the past, making of them a crushing weight on potential achievement by the living. Now, since Nietzsche, the 20th century has seen plenty of antipathy to history built on an Enlightenment edifice of progress, though paradoxically relatively scant interrogation of the notion that the past is inevitably written by those with the so-called big battalions. Often, its inescap inescapability is asserted as a throwaway an axiom, a point that is so self-evident as to require no further explanation, much less examination. Let us take two examples. In his brilliant reflections on history, Walter Benjamin, who had experienced defeat and loss at first hand, unsuccessfully fleeing the Nazi war machine, criticized the dominant 19th and early 20th century European approach to the past, historicism, by asking and answering his own question, with whom do its adherents sympathize? The answer he wrote is inevitable with the victor. Like Benjamin, his friend and editor, Hannah Arendt, evinced a distrust of linear progressivist history and also skepticism to its vaunted, and in her view, hollow, virtues of impartiality and objectivity. For Arendt, true impartiality in recitation of the past was embodied in Homer's decision to, quote, sing the deeds of the Trojans no less than the Achaeans, and to praise the glory of Hector no less than the greatness of Achilles. And also in Herodotus's discarding of the binary alternative of victory and defeat, which, Arendt writes, moderns have felt expresses the objective judgment of history itself. On the whole, however, the awarding of laurels to the victor has been, well before Hegel put it in world historical terms, the hegemonic strain in Western historical thought. It's in itself a forceful current that instinctively sweeps away those on the wrong side of progress, dispatching them, as Trotsky put it, to his equivalent of the empty bottle, the dustbin of history. Reaction to this made both Arendt and Benjamin, and in a somewhat different way Karl Popper, into critics not only of history, but of the very notion of forward-moving, linear time, which, at least until their day, underpinned it. While the authors of a recent book on counterfactuals quote Benjamin's victor's remark approvingly, once again as if his comment were to be read axiomatically rather than as a provocation to reflection, which I think is the case, I think that may be too literal a reading of Benjamin. For Benjamin, in a way, we are all history's losers, for his angel of history sees nothing in the past but a single catastrophe as it is dragged relentlessly forward into the future. Postmodernism, with its Leotardian distrust of Western narratives, of which the inevitability of modernization is one, and Western liberal democracies triumph another, has continued to endorse the assumption that history, by definition, is inescapably the discourse of the victorious, that its linearity and perhaps inescapable teleology must inevitably do the work of the dominant and the oppressor, and that it is inexorably hostile to counter-tendencies, paths not taken, and alternative pasts. Early in his 1995 book, Nothing But History, David D. Roberts, the scholar of Benedetta Croce, asserts bluntly that, quote, history is always written by the victors and victory conflates with domination and exclusion. Commenting on Benjamin's resentment of the dominance of historical victors, Roberts appears again to endorse this view. In the nature of things, quote, 
any reality will be particular, resting on the power of the victors and the particular remembering and forgetting that are bound up with their victory. And Roberts asks whether appeals to truth and reality in history by their very nature push against dissent, against alternatives, and thereby simply serve the authoritarian hegemony of the winners and the powerful. Now, Roberts is far from alone in this position, and one need not subscribe to postmodernism to support it. So commonplace is the assumption that we must be prisoners or dupes of history as a tale told not by madmen, but by very sane, powerful, and calculating ones. In a recent textbook on the philosophy of history, Michael Stanford has commented on the inherent bias of historical evidence on past times, noting first the sheer chance of some documents surviving and some not, and chance in what was written about and what wasn't, all of which is perfectly true. But Stanford then goes on to say that a greater resu bias results from the fact that the winners, not the losers, write history. Now, Stanford's formulation is more measured than some, certainly more measured than Robert's, but its unqualified phrasing remains an unfortunate oversimplification. Benjamin Stanford, Roberts, and others are quite right that popular perceptions of the past and national memorial cultures are dominated by victor history, and not merely in the obvious realms of politics and war. The very hegemony of Western culture and its assumption of Euro-American modernity as a universal standard over the past two centuries or so at least attests to this. And there are far too many examples from three millennia of human descriptions of the past and the relative scarcity of counter-narratives to make a blanket refutation impossible. Instances of regimes and states exercising authority through the encouragement of official versions of history and the prevention or outright destruction of alternative views are legion. They range from the micro instances of censorship and persecution of individual historians going back millennia and still occurring in our own day to more macro level efforts by those in power to control the perception of the past. To quote George L. Orwell once again, in 1984, this is often a high-stakes game with much more than simply the status of the past at issue. Quote, he who controls the present controls the past. He who controls the past controls the future is the party slogan parroted by Orwell's protagonist Winston Smith early in the novel and repeated several times thereafter. One should, of course, be cautious in connecting defeat with virtue and victory with the title of oppressor. Sometimes history written from loss is not, from the point of view of modern ethics and social values, on the correct side of history. Consider, for instance, the noxious legacy of American Civil War lost cause historiography created after the defeat of the Confederacy and abolition of slavery in the United States. It continues today to poison race relations, feed conspiracy theories, and polarize political culture in the West's largest democracy. In one of the best among several recent books on statue controversies, Alex von Tunzelman introduces her discussion of the New Orleans statue of General Robert E. Lee as follows, quote, it is often said that history is written by the victors, this is a story as how it was rewritten by the losers, and she does not intend this as a compliment. The late Canadian journalist Erna Paris, encountering a vehement lost causer, found that this person had no need to remember, understand, or reconcile anything about his country's history beyond the myths to which he was bound, because for him, past and present had not yet diverged. The Confederate lost cause is by no means the sole example of loss as providing a never-ending, dangerous, often violent grudge and a sense of having been robbed. The post-1918 uh, German stab-in-the-back myth is a European example, and the big lie conspiracy theories around the 2020 U.S. election ideological kin with the lost cause and with many of the same adherents is another. 
Now, all of these could be dismissed as mass culture variants of pathological nostalgia, a clinical, emotionally crippling condition, generally harmful to the sufferer, but to no one else, as Enlightenment and 19th century medicine characterized that sentiment before, before nostalgia acquired its more pleasant modern association, had they not affected such baleful consequences for subsequent generations. A binary one must resist is the notion that writers of history must be either on the winning or the losing side. It's possible to be on both. Chinese historians caught in dynastic transitions, such as that from the Ming to the Manchurian Qing in 1644, found themselves employed in various capacities by the new dynasty, often assisting in the traditional task of writing the definitive history of the old one. Wan Zitong, 1638 to 1702, a child at the collapse of the Ming Dynasty, joined his teacher, Wang Songxi, in refusing to serve the new regime directly. When invited to provide information to the compilers of the Ming history, however, he accepted, though refusing a salary, perhaps in order to gather materials for his own privately written account of the Ming. Some of those conquered were, on the contrary, quite willing to switch to the winning team. For instance, the 13th century Persian Giovanni, historian of the victorious Mongols. Niccolo Machiavelli, in early 16th century Florence, would strive to make himself useful to the restored Medici regime that had imprisoned and tortured him. So we should therefore resist a winner-loser dichotomy and even more so an automatic ennobling of the defeated. To invert uh, an above-quoted remark, sometimes the right side actually does win. World War II, the U.S. Civil War being good examples, we just don't need to confine our thinking along such dyads or assign an ambiguous moral virtue to the winners. A significant stream of Western criticism from antiquity to the present has long considered tragedy, which invariably results in heroic defeat and usually death, the highest of the literary reforms, literary forms, and history cast in that mode is likelier to exalt the defeated and the doomed. Hayden White demonstrated in Meta History half a century ago that certain 19th century historians. Tocqueville, for instance, implanted their works as tragedy, which by its very definition ends badly for the protagonist, which, as in Tocqueville's case, need not be an individual. It could be a whole country. A good North American counterpart comes from the work of the Quebec notary François-Xavier Garneau, for whom the conquest of Quebec by the British in the Seven Years' War, half a century before his birth, was but the first part of a two-act tragedy, the second episode of which the move to assimilate Quebec culture after the 1840 Act of Union provided the inspiration to Garneau's lengthy history from the perspective of the conquered. A great people, Garneau wrote, directly quoting the French historian Augustin Thierry, are not so speedily subjugated as the official acts of those who govern it by force would have the world believe. He was well aware that in reproving the, decree, the decrees of an all-potent metropolitan state, we may be denounced on one hand as propagators of pernicious opinions and on the other regarded as the purblind votaries of a separate nationality, which had best become extinct. And I'm just going to have one more section and then a short conclusion so we can have time for, for questions. So one question to ask is, is loss or suffering an essential condition of the most profound historical writing, as Frank Ankersmith has proposed? Ernest Renan observed long ago that suffering in common unites more than does joy, and that mourning has more validity than triumph. Recalled and recounted in the right way, failures are sometimes more productive in the long run than victories. Sometimes a defeat from long ago can be revisited by modern historians and turned into a symbol of courage, self-sacrifice, and a spirit of resistance that would eventually produce triumph. Jewish historical tradition is, of course, replete with stories of disasters, 
that were followed by escape, release, victory, and conquest. Some such episodes have been suppressed by the vanquished only to be revived at a later stage. The famous instance of defeat at the Masada in 70 AD found little place in Jewish historical memory till the early 20th century when the Zionist movement adopted it and made it newly relevant in the drive for a Jewish homeland. Past heroes, even defeated ones, can be converted into forerunners, even antitypes of Latter-day figures. In the wake of their retreat to Formosa in 1949, defeated Chinese nationalists identified their leader, Chiang Kai-shek, with Gu Zhan, the ancient Chinese king of the kingdom of Yu. In the early 5th century, Yu had suffered defeat at the hands of Wu, a rival kingdom. After enduring a humiliating slavery for some years, Gu Zhan returned to Yu, raised an army, and eventually conquered Wu. And of course, those who have lost can sometimes become fascinated by their enemies and eager to understand their success. Thucydides' account of the Peloponnesian War stopped several years short of Spartan victory, but he was an astute observer who could see which way the winds were blowing and how Athenian arrogance and internal division after the death of Pericles was leading to disaster. Three centuries later, with Greece as a whole now subordinated to the new Mediterranean superpower, Rome, the political prisoner turned guest Polybius was impelled by defeat to explain the astonishingly fast rise of Rome to imperial power and in the process crafted the first entangled history of the Mediterranean world. I'm going to skip now to the conclusion. In a seminal article on Hannah Arendt's book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, Shoshana Thelman characterizes Adolf Eichmann's trial as itself a Nietzschean monumental history, but in this instance, a history not in prose, but staged as performance, the monument being not the ex-Nazi facing judgment, but the millions of the dead. Thelman also points to the fact that catastrophic events such as the Holocaust cannot be understood purely through legal means, and that art has a role to play. Law distances such events, and art brings them closer. History is an ancient art, and it has been used as long as law, perhaps longer, to comprehend the past, both recent and remote. It will continue to form that function so long as there are victors and vanquished wishing to memorialize, explain, record and understand both their own and their antecedents' pasts. Most people understand that for every victory or every conquest, there is a loss, but will nonetheless read, study, or watch history through the filter of success and progress. But loss in its various forms has its own history. Awareness and experience of such loss, either directly or vicariously, has been far more influential in shaping perceptions of the past than has been allowed. Beyond this, acknowledgement of history from loss as a category serves other purposes, that of pluralizing understandings of the past beyond homogeneous national narratives, and of engendering empathy and respect for the condition of loss, and also for those among the defeated who chronicled it. Thanks for listening. Well, thank you for this stimulating, thought-provoking talk. Uh, at least on my behalf, it was very interesting. I enjoyed any minute of it and kept brainstorming about things in my field of expertise. So um, now then I think we can take uh, questions for um, Dr. Wolf. Um, 